they believe that they wouldn't dare attack Israel. And I can almost hear every senior officer up the chain of command going, they might have the capability, but they wouldn't dare. We have a large army. We have a big reaction force. We can level their country. The problem is when you have that mindset that you have technological superiority, firepower superiority, you always find yourself in a position where you ignore culture, you ignore language, and you can ignore people who are warning you to your face they are coming to kill you. This is a Visegrad 24 series about the Israel-Hamas war. We're here with Malcolm Nance, global counterterrorism expert, former U.S. Uh, intelligence officer, uh, New York Times bestseller, and uh, Ukrainian legionnaire. Uh, welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. It seems that you go from conflict to conflict, and how long has this been going on for? For about 40 years, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, you know, we find, I find myself in Israel right now, here to study uh, the October 7th massacre and then the subsequent Israeli-Hamas war which is, is going on. But I started out at age 19 in Beirut, Lebanon in 1983. So uh, also here in the region. As coming into the region, uh, in, in fact, my, second, my first day, full day in the Middle East was the day that the American embassy, the first American embassy bombing happened that killed 69 people in a suicide bombing. And from that point onward, uh, right up till now, I've been working this region with a little stint in Eastern Europe in the Ukrainian army. When people think about October 7th, many said initially that this was an enormous intelligence failure, that uh, the Israelis were caught off guard. Mm. And it seems like everybody is agreeing with this, even the Israelis themselves. How would you say, how, how, did, how do you think that Hamas managed to pull this off? Well, let's put it this way. Hamas pulled off the operation, but they didn't pull off masking what they were doing. The reason that it was an intelligence failure, and I can tell you this personally, I was a field collector for most of my life, either doing listening or having to fuse imagery intelligence and human intelligence together, which should give you a picture. It appears at the lower levels, and it's always at what we call the collector's level, right? The person listening to the headphones or watching the video cameras who saw that there were activities that were out of the out of normal, right? It's particularly in signals intelligence. Uh, but as it went up the chain of command, uh, they saw the rehearsals, they saw the preparations that Hamas was making. And what you do is you get to a point where you have to bring this information to the decision makers, but you have to also temper it against your own belief system. And here is where Israel failed. Their intelligence failure was not based on the information. Um, because our system in the United States, we have a, a, how can I put it, a special communication system. So if the president of the United States needs to see something that is critical, that would give you a, an unambiguous indication that something strange was happening, we can get it to him within five minutes. But the system is designed in our world to push up threats, warnings of threats. The Israeli system, it appeared, was, how can I put it? It was shaped by one word. And, you know, no offense to the Israelis, but it's true. That word is arrogance. They were arrogant. They believed, how can I put it? We have all these, these funny little phrases in the, in the spy world. Um, they believed that they wouldn't dare attack Israel. And I can almost hear every senior officer up the chain of command going, they might have the capability, but they wouldn't dare. We have a large army. We have a big reaction force. We can level their country. The problem is when you have that mindset that you have technological superiority, firepower superiority, you always find yourself in a position where you ignore culture, you ignore language, and you can ignore people who are warning you to your face they are coming to kill you. I've actually seen this happen in the U.S. intelligence community in places that we, you know, where we were fighting, where you can give them all the, 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 the raw intentions of your enemy and straight up warnings 
where I would always run into one officer who would say, well, they're not going to do that. Don't they know we're the United States? When you hit that wall, if there isn't a policy bypass on arrogance or the they wouldn't dare attitude, then you're going to get stuck with what happened to Israel, which is Hamas watched carefully. They studied their enemy. They had 15,000 guest workers going in and out of Israel every day. They spent years developing an underground tunnel network instead of building protections for its citizens so that they could carry out this very operation. But before they can carry out this operation, they have to come up with a plan. What is their strategic goal? And where we are today in Gaza was Hamas's strategic goal, which was to come out, bloody Israel, punch them in the nose, withdraw back to Gaza, and let the Israelis bomb their facilities and peoples using, uh, using the Hamas, uh, the Palestinian people, not as human shields, as what I would call human sponges. They were to absorb the blows of the Israeli Air Force, cause massive casualties due to collateral damage. The Israelis are not aiming at civilians. They're aiming at tunnel entrances. They're aiming at, you know, places where rockets are coming from, which happen to be next to schools and mosques. So Israel's own arrogance allowed them to follow Hamas's plan on what Hamas wanted to do and unfortunately caused them this pogrom of 1,200 Israeli citizens. A part of intelligence gathering is also assessing what the war goals are of the other side. Mm -hmm. So you clearly stated here that um, for Hamas, civilian casualties is actually something that they want. Right. Uh, what type of reaction is it that they want from other countries? Because it seems that they are trying to rile up the Arab street, so to say, uh, and topple these often authoritarian regimes, but regimes which don't really care about the Palestinian issue. They are rather more issued on self-preservation and keeping themselves in power. Uh, is this an assessment that is more or less correct? Yeah, that is correct. However, this is where Hamas's arrogance comes and plays into it. I mean, we're, you're looking at two sides that have some capability, and we would call that asymmetric, right? Hamas's capability was two men riding on motor scooters or in pickup trucks going into Israel, breaching the wall on a holiday and then killing every individual they, they encountered. Man, woman, child, Christian, Muslim, Druze, Buddhist, right? Israel's asymmetric response was overwhelming firepower. But what was Hamas's strategic goal? Their goal was to penetrate Israel. That's a tactical goal. Did they bypass the villages in Kibbutzim? and engage the Israeli army and do a stand-up fight, army, you know, warfare unit to warfare unit. No, which transitioned them to straight terrorism, yeah. straight terrorist organization. Then they withdrew back to their tunnel network with the goal of bringing the Israelis in quickly. And this is where the United States assisted because the Secretary of Defense uh, we brought in experts who had fought in Mosul, Fallujah, Tikrit, Raqqa, and told the Israelis, slow this down. Do not go in. They want you to go in. They're ready for you, right? They want a little mini Gaza uh, Stalingrad. So by slowing it down, the Israelis shaping the battlefield over almost three weeks, uh, they defeated Hamas's goals and then were able to penetrate and surround Gaza. The problem is Hamas's number one goal is precisely what you said. The entire invasion of Israel, because that's what it was, was designed to get the Muslim world to do what? To do 1967, 1973? They failed to understand no Muslim leader was coming to their aid. Hezbollah sold them out in the first days. Iran within the first week said, we weren't told. His Nasrallah in Lebanon said, we weren't told. The, 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 the Syrian government wasn't told. Who exactly was going to come to your assistance? Now, Hamas is in a war for its own survival, and it will not survive because Israel must eliminate them militarily at the very least 
for them to, you know, to have any measure of security. If we look long term, there are, there is a debate what Israel should do once the IDF has full control of the Gaza Strip. Should they administer it themselves for some time? Should they hand it over to the Palestinian Authority, uh, some other Palestinian group which is supported by Saudi Arabia and Qatar? What do you think? What is most likely, and what do you think would be the best solution? Well, I'll tell you right now, the worst solution would be for Israel to 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 try to administer itself. Israel's going to have to go at some point, and it hasn't happened yet, from full-scale war fighting. And this is where I think people are really confused. I've been around a lot of wars. I just participated in a major war fighting Russia. Um, look, what Israel is fighting right now, what they've been doing over 100 days, has been full-scale war. This is not a counterinsurgency war where you can roll into a village and de deploy your tanks and then get shot at by one guy. Every minute of every day of the last 100 some odd days, the Israeli army has been engaged in full scale combat. People don't seem to understand. Hamas had a 30,000 man terror force fully stocked with weapons smuggled from Iran, North Korea and other countries. And Israel is now fighting them. I believe the They've lost over 150 soldiers in ground combat in the last 100 days alone. That's a lot for this country. But people seem to think that it's just a one-sided war. Hamas is sitting still, civilians are sitting there, and Israel's bombing them. That's not what's happening. This is door-to-door, street-to-street, man-to-man individual combat. And for Hamas to have been fighting this long through an underground network of tunnels, and Israel having to use a large portion of its overwhelming force uh, just shows you the intensity of one, how deep Hamas dug itself in, and two, how they have to operate within a civilian population in an area that's only 40 kilometers long by, I think, I believe six or eight kilometers deep, that's built up to 10 to 20 stories of urban, of urban setting. No one has fought in this kind of terrain since World War II. And this is the only way to take terrain. You can't take it from the air, so you have to but go in. But you can't and administer this. Is... this. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's mm -hmm. not like Israel's going to be able to do that. So there's going to have to be some rapprochement. Uh, and then the political solution is going to have to come in. Whether Israel chooses this policy of breaking them up to tribes, which, by the way, was an American strategy, which was successful after the, battle of, the Second Battle of Fallujah, in which we allowed the tribal chiefs to increase their power, decentralize the terrorist power by giving them the food, giving them the money, giving them the weapons to create their own uh, defense forces. Israel's not gonna do that, right? No one's ever gonna have a weapon there again. But to feed the population, to remove control from the Hamas military wing, which will be difficult because they're overwhelmingly supported. Uh, but now it's time to bring the Gulf states in. But the only way that you're going to be able to get any kind of support from the Arab world is there's going to have to be a two-state solution put on the table. Uh, apart from the audience that uh, was in the Middle East, the so-called Arab street, um, there is also the audience in Europe and the U.S. Uh, we know, for example, that the Vietnam War, in many ways, the American army wasn't defeated in any way. Uh, you had the Tet Offensive that was... A media blow you could say because quickly the americans they got a hold of the situation but the images that were rolling on on television back in the u.s it it really broke the will to fight among a large percentage of the people sure um the images that are now being seen on tvs and smartphones in the u.s and and europe uh is there a risk that america could in the future remove its support from israel i mean if we look at college campuses it looks like the young generation is definitely not on the Israeli side in this conflict. First off, college campuses do not represent the American electorate or the opinion of the United States. The American opinion is overwhelmingly in support of Israel. You know, there's a, what's happening now is that there's a generational shift. I, I believe there was a, a poll about six weeks ago which showed 18 to 34 percent, 18 to 34 year old Americans were 57% in believing that the attacks of October 7th were justified. And that shows to me, I mean, I've, I've been at this game for, for decades now, that shows to me that there's a level of ignorance amongst that body of people 
on two levels. First, historical, because people who are above the age of 34, mainly 45 to 75 in the United States, they remember World War II, which their parents fought in. They understood the context of the Holocaust. They understood the context of the creation of Israel and how Israel survived multiple invasions and wars with the Arab states and defeated everyone who attacked them or who they were engaged in conflict with, with the slight exception of Lebanon, right? With Hezbollah in Lebanon. So the American youth who are making these opinions, my personal opinion, they're the most uninformed people I've ever seen. They're getting their information from 30 second TikTok videos, which are straight up propaganda and lies. I've got American kids today in Columbia University in New York supporting the Ansarullah terrorist group in Yemen, one of the most repressive groups in the world who do not believe in gay or lesbian rights or women's rights. They make child soldiers and they are firing Iranian-backed, you know, they're Iranian-backed Shia militia that are firing anti-ship missiles and ballistic missiles. They can't even feed their own mothers. So we've got kids in the United States going, oh, yay, Yemen striking back in America. 75% of the United States backs Israel because we understand, one, this is a vibrant democracy. And here's something that I have a hard time explaining to my people of color uh, youth in my country. This is a very brown country. This is not a country of the image they believe of white Europeans running this place. The Mizrahi, 80% of Israelis come from, are from the diaspora, from the Arab world. Whether they were Iraqi, I met Iraqi uh, Jews myself out in Fallujah. I met, which is, by the way, a historic center of Jewish learning at the time of Christ. Um, I've met well, the huge population in Morocco, most of whom are, are here in this country. Yemeni Jews are famous. Uh, so this misperception, misinformation and lies, which have now been harnessed by the free Palestine, essentially pro-Hamas movement around the world, is embedding these lies through really uh, social media that does not allow for any real historical context or accuracy. We have uh, this war going on right now, but at the same time, it's not receiving as much media attention at the moment, but the war in Ukraine is also still going on. Uh, how would you say that these two wars uh, affect each other, or rather, do they play into some grander scheme? Because there are these speculations that this all, is all very beneficial to Russia, and at the same time, Iran is, could be some form of middleman between Russia and Hamas, of course, there's always China lurking in the background, just hoping for any type of mistake that will allow them to try to um, get primacy on the world stage. Yeah. Uh, how do you think, how does this war fit the larger geopolitical picture in the world? Well, it's, it's now you see it's become a center point of how nations are viewing each other. And it's created a lot of animosity. Uh, Russia, look, say what you will about Vladimir Putin, but he was an ex-KGB officer. You know, when I was doing my fourth book about Donald Trump and his relationships with Russia, I went to Vladimir Putin's office in Dresden, where he worked, and sat there. This guy was a pure intelligence officer. He was about manipulating people. His other peers just wanted to live in East Germany and drink beer. Putin loves the art of manipulation. He was losing badly geopolitically in Ukraine just as badly as he's losing his army. And his army is virtually broken in Ukraine. He has no combat capacity left. He's essentially throwing meat attacks of human waves at the Ukrainian army who are destroying them with drones. Um, but he also understood that by destabilizing the West, by first using immigration warfare, bringing people up, you see what happened in Finland just recently, allowing Indian, Iranian, and Sub-Saharan African immigrants to travel through Moscow, go to St. Petersburg, drive them to the Finnish border, and then make them walk across the border as punishment for joining NATO. Uh, he saw that that was successful when Turkey did it by flooding Europe with a million Syrian refugees. So now that's a weapon that he harnesses. Uh, but he also uses destabilization with his militia, PMC Wagner, throughout the North Africa and the Sahel region, 
we saw that there were photographs of PMC Wagner trainers operating with Hamas over the last year. Uh, but more importantly, this relationship with Iran, by who is giving him advanced ballistic missile systems, drone systems, technology to strike Ukraine, Iran directly supports Hezbollah, Hamas, and Yemen as the circle of Shi the Shia crescent around Israel. By doing this and allowing Israel to do what they do, their propaganda systems were primed and ready to influence the United States in the current U.S. elections. They have a presidential candidate who is willing to turn off all aid to Ukraine and destroy NATO, but who would also, on the other hand, encourage any Israeli government to essentially clear and wipe out Gaza. All of this destabilizes the norms that have been set since World War II, and Russia knows it. But e even now, we have a situation in which both Ukraine aid and Israel aid is not able to pass through Congress. Uh, what is uh, the reason for, for the current situation? Well, I mean, it, it, there's only two words to explain it. Donald Trump. Donald Trump, however, in whatever way that he's beholden to Russia. Again, I've written four books about Donald Trump's relationships with Putin, the KGB. You know, I mean, he, he was under KGB surveillance as early as 1977. His second wife's father reported on him to the KGB through the Czech STB intelligence agency for years, for years. They understand how he thinks. Also, Trump has this relationship with Putin, which no one can figure out. Why is such a subordinate, submissive relationship to the point where he was ready to dismantle NATO as president of the United States, which would be Putin's greatest gift. More importantly, Trump says, because the Vlad, uh, Vladimir Zelensky did not carry out a false investigation of Joe Biden, Trump was impeached for that the second time. He now hates Ukraine, hates Zelensky, and if he could cut off every dollar, he would. The Republican Party does what he says. The Republican Party, though, is running Congress with one, one vote. And I think that Ukraine will get funded. I think that there may be, in fact, an opportunity to flip the Congress back to the control of the Democrats and get things passed there. So uh, same thing with the support for Israel. You have to understand the conservatives in the United States, the hardliners who are really military forward, anti-Russia, anti-Soviet Union, pro-Israel, you know, anti-terrorist, have turned into a party that will do whatever Donald Trump says. Yeah, it's not the foreign policy of the 1980s, that's, that's for sure. Or the 60s. <laughs> yeah. uh, if we return to counterterrorism, uh, a large problem for the IDF is the fact that you still have more than 100 hostages that are in Gaza at the moment. Uh, what do you believe? What are the main problems that the IDF has in connection with this? Okay. Um, you know, the funny thing is, when I was in the U.S. Armed Forces, I ran a military hostage survival school uh, where we would train special operations soldiers that could be captured uh, by uh, terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, what would later become ISIS, how to behave in captivity. And, but one of the factors that you have to uh, introduce them to is the possibility that you may be in captivity for a period of time because the fastest way to recover you or rescue you is to win the war. The IDF can only do so much. I mean, they are in a street-to-street -street war with what Hamas says is 500 kilometers of tunnels underneath it, going from end to end throughout Gaza. People may be held down there. People may be being shuttled around. We learned from many of the hostages, they were kept in civilian houses before they were moved to hospitals and tunnel networks. So. You're talking 100, maybe 150 um, individual choke points where small clusters of people can be shuttled around. When we tried to do what we called the hostage isolation operations of the 1980s, trying to identify where 100 Western hostages were being kept in Lebanon, we found that they were constantly being shuttled around. Also, they wouldn't communicate about the hostages on telephone or in other methods like that. 
hostages who escaped uh, were almost routinely captured because they didn't know where they were. Also, civilians would turn you in. There's an entire myriad of things that could or could not happen. But to be quite honest, all they need to do is try to have faith. The Israeli army is looking for them. And, but to look for them, before you can look down, you have to look through every square meter of the surface war, you know, the surface plane of Gaza, and then work your way down. Uh, yeah, as you said, uh, winning the war is probably the best way, uh, especially because in that last stage of the war, just before you're about to surrender, the opposite side is desperate and they start making deals in, in order to save their own skin. Yes, there are still hostages left. We know where they are. We're willing to hand them over if our families can get out and, and so on. Uh, but um, uh, returning here to the war has now been going on for more than three months. It seems that Hamas is still very well equipped. Of course, they were in control of the Gaza Strip since 2005. How did they manage to amass this arsenal of weapons? And to what degree do you believe that Iran was responsible for it? Well, Iran has made it clear that they've supported Hamas. Uh, the smuggling tunnel network between the Sinai Peninsula across the Philadelphia corridor was extensive. I mean, it's huge. Oh, you know, you can almost drive trucks through these tunnels down there, even though the IDF and the Egyptians were trying to destroy these things. The Sinai is an enormous area. Egypt was also undergoing, and still is, undergoing its own Islamic war in the Sinai Peninsula with an ISIS element that is fighting the Egyptian army. Weapons, I saw when I was doing studies of the Egyptian war in the Sinai, we saw weapons that when I was in Libya in 2011, were quietly flowing across Egypt and going across the Sinai and then showing up inside of Hamas's tunnel systems. Smuggling is very profitable, especially when you're talking about a population that's 2.2 million. You're talking about free Iranian money, which will flow, you know, as we have this little joke in the intelligence community, I'm going to start putting gold on the table and you tell me when it's too heavy for you to carry. That's your price. There is enough money out there to wear Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, groups like that, which Iran backs, can get the resources that it needs when the money is good enough. Israel cannot intervene until it, of course, crosses that Egyptian border. Speaking about the Sinai Peninsula, um, this Islamist uh, insurgency um, that has been going on over there, it was really strengthened after 2011 with the Arab Spring and when Mohammed Morsi came to power and later was overthrown by the military. Um, and these radical elements of the Muslim Brotherhood also moved to the Sinai Peninsula and with time merged with, with ISIS. Um, but we should also remember about the connection between Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood because originally they were an offshoot, you could say, of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. And also this is probably something that people marching at these college campuses in the U.S. don't realize that uh, Hamas is not some form of liberation movement. They are also an Islamist uh, terrorist organization. But the, the Islamist component is also not to be ignored. So how, how do they relate to other Islamist groups in the region? It's fascinating because what you're talking about, if you recall back what we used to call the good old bad days of terrorism, Palestinian terrorism, right? The 1970s, 80s, plane, plane early 90s. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but those groups, P Al Fatah, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, they were socialist organizations where they had, they would have, um, you know, uh, Palestinian women and and Druze women, Maronite Christians who were who were Palestinians who would come into these groups and they would go out and do this revolutionary warfare you know, in order to be a national liberation movement, right? That's gone. That died with Yasser Arafat. Um, as you said, the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood and the rise of the pan-Islamic movement, uh, which is fascinating because Hamas is generally a Sunni Muslim organization, but their money comes from a Shia nation that in any other circumstance would have wiped them out, right? But they are the closest to Israel proper. 
right? As opposed to Hezbollah being in Lebanon, the ones who can really reach out and touch. So as the pan-Islamist movement, whether it's Shia, radical Shia Islam, radical Sunni Islam, uh, you know, Sunni Jihadism, as we saw with ISIS al-Qaeda, uh, has really just wiped away that nationalism. Their idea of nationalism, if you read the Hamas charter, it is not about regaining Palestine as just a Palestinian homeland. Yeah, it's not it's mentioned about, anywhere. No, it's about cleansing what, you know, is now modern Israel for Islam. It's almost, how can I put it? It's the, sort of the way that Al-Qaeda did it too. I wrote, a, I, I wrote a whole book on Al-Qaeda. I wrote a New York Times bestseller on ISIS and their ideology. It's, it's more dawah to them, right? An Islamic calling, uh, a, a form of evangelism, and that the greatest individual calling you can have is not to get Palestine just back to reverse the Nakba, right? To reverse the tragedy of 1948. But it's to create, you know, they're, they're in technically in jihad. They're in holy war against, against it, uh, Judaism. Yeah, there's a reason for why they chose to name this operation Al-Aqsa Flood. Right. The Al-Aqsa is supposed to unite the entire Ummah, the entire Muslim world, to come to their aid. Uh, so they are also fighting for the entire uh, Muslim world. And naturally, according to this Islamist worldview, that Dar al-Harb, the, the, the house of war, meaning the non-Muslim areas, mm -hmm. they are supposed to become smaller and smaller with time until there is a global Ummah and the entire world is um, under the, the Muslim faith. So this Islamist component does that not make it so much harder to find a peace settlement, uh, an opportunity for negotiations? Is, is, is this an absolutist uh, ideology that they are facing? How, how do you negotiate? Well, you know, it's, it's very hard to defeat an ideology. It's easy to defeat men with rifles. But before anything can happen, you have to defeat the men with rifles. You have to break their military capacity to oppose you or to oppose anyone else. Of course, now you will shift, as I said a little earlier, from war fighting to counterinsurgency to civil affairs, all of which can be happening in a one kilometer area, right? One block you're doing civil affairs, feeding people. Next block you're doing counterinsurgency against, you know, individual guys who pop up. And then a kilometer away, you are full scale at war. So with that happening at one time, you have to now figure out who your partners are. The, you know, I said very early on, this is unfortunately a time where radical political change will have to happen here. Uh, the, the centralized belief that there can be no place for Palestinians anywhere is, is, is just been proven false. You're going to have to, sometimes, you know, you're going to have to negotiate with your enemies. Hamas cannot be your enemy, all right? The biggest strategic mistake I think that Israel has made was... We're trying to, was, how can I put it, isolating Yasser Arafat simply because of what Yasser Arafat did in the 60s and 70s and 80s. But when Arafat became the head of, you know, Fatah moved and transitioned to the Palestinian Authority, okay, the key move should have been to strengthen them, not to split them. And by allowing Hamas, a terrorist group, to actually win an election and rise and slaughter the Palestinian Authority, and you sit back and you think, wow, that was for the Munich Olympics. Now what you've done is you created another monster. And it's, it, it's as you said, there's an Islamic component now. Pan-nationalism, Palestinian nationalism was something you could deal with. Now we're talking about nationalism based on a Salafist jihad. Uh, I think it's going to be much harder. But you, you know, the Palestinian people are going to have to make some hard decisions for themselves. We're also talking about how Hamas tried to influence the so-called Arab street, that that was their audience. But there is also a large audience in the West Bank. And it seems that this war, the attack, the October 7th massacre, it has only strengthened the sympathy for Hamas in the West Bank. Is this something that you believe that that is the case? Will, will the Palestinian Authority will be able to survive in its current form in the West Bank? Or is there a risk that radical elements will try to take over power. Of course, Israel has forces on the ground there, so it's much harder for them to do, but will they get authority over the majority of the population there? 
Well, you know, I'm going to look at it from from my perspective, working you know in the counterterrorism intelligence world for decades. It's going to be very hard, but you have to kill them first, and then you have to figure out. And this is where honesty and a, you have to choke down your arrogance comes into it to realize to have a political solution, you need to have a political partner and you have to be willing to talk to them as opposed to rule over them. Hamas right now has 90% approval in the West Bank, which means that place could become a flash keg. It could be a, a place where Hamas ideology, right? This radical, hardcore Islamist absolutism for the elimination and destruction of all Jews in, in Israel. That's their ideology. You're going to have to intervene when this war is over and you've broken them militarily, and you're going to have to replace that with hope. You mentioned earlier that there could be partners in the Gulf that could be of assistance in any type, type of former uh, future settlement. Uh, who in the Gulf do you think would be the best partner? Because it seems that Israel is still very willing to continue their uh, normalization with uh, Saudi Arabia, but the relations with Qatar are slightly worse. Uh, where do you think that the chances are? I don't think the relations with Qatar are as bad as people think. Qatar is always, Qatar chose to be the intermediary nation of the Gulf states. Mm -hmm. And they allowed both sides to have a, a, a home. I mean, we have the largest military base in the Middle East, Al Udaid Air Base, you know, Al Ubaid Air Base in Qatar. And at the same time, they have the headquarters of Hamas, right? Uh, the leadership living down there in uh, Taliban were negotiating. The Taliban were living there and negotiating there. This is where Qatar has decided they want to be the interoculars of the Muslim world. And we should let them continue that mission. The question is who can enforce anything on the ground? Can it be the Saudis? The Saudis don't want to go back on the ground. They were just in Yemen and failed in a seven year, eight year war in trying to intervene on their own borders when their own country was being bombarded with missiles by Iran. The Saudis are looking eastward. Iran is their biggest issue. The United Arab Emirates, rich, a lot of money. They rebuilt Beirut after it was completely leveled, right? But do they want to take over the care and feeding of a 2.2 million person population, right? That's as big as the population of the Emirates right now with all the expats. Um, you know, is it going to be a pan-Arab pool of money? Well, that existed already. And Hamas used it to build the biggest tunnel network there. So I think the real big issue of what happens on the day after Hamas ends, right? Uh, whether you're going to, I mean, the infrastructure is gone. The administration is gone. Uh, other than their propaganda ministry, uh, once Hamas's military force is gone, new groups and structures will have to be built. However, let's be honest, the first leaders are taking their lives into their hands because anyone that will assist the Israelis is going to be seen as an enemy. Uh, a final question here. Um, another front of the war, you could say, is the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And now recently we have UK and American airstrikes. Uh, there are some speculations that there, there, has, there have also been Israeli airstrikes recently. Uh, where do you think that the situation with, with Yemen is going? Will there be more engagement uh, in Yemen? Will this develop into a larger uh, conflict? I don't, I don't know if it'll develop into a larger conflict, but I think we're going to see small scale strikes from the United States and its allies because one quarter of the Earth's shipping was going through the Suez Canal and is now being forced to go around, you know, South Africa. And that disrupted uh, global supply chains. It raised the prices of things. And it allowed essentially an Iranian-backed terrorist group to just dictate what happens in the Red Sea in the Bab el-Mendab waterway. Uh, by creating this coalition, we can establish convoys. But more importantly, it's the capability of Yemen. The United States estimates that in that one-night strike, we destroyed 30 percent of what they have. Now, if Yemen wants to show that they still have the capacity, that requires them to bring their anti-ship missiles out of their caves or storage facilities which will allow us to strike them again. Once that capability is gone, um, and it would have to be to restore it, it would have to come directly from Iran by ship, which is how it was coming before. Uh, we will then have the ability to remove them and bring them down to small fishing boats, which I think is easily manageable. Apparently a few days ago, uh, there was such an attempt with a vessel going from Iran 
heading for Yemen and American Navy SEALs were trying to board it. And unfortunately, one of them fell overboard. A second one jumped in after him right. and they're still looking for them. Um, so it seems that the Iranians are still, even in this very moment, trying to resupply the uh, the Houthis in, in Yemen. Um, do we need more ships in the region to be able to form some, some form of iron ring to make sure that these Iranian ships can't can slip through? Well, I mean, we've been doing interdiction in the high seas down in the Babel Mendab waterway for decades, uh, trying to find Iranian, North Korean weapons, things that we had seen being transshipped to the uh, to the Houthi terrorists. I think it'll have to be increased. Germany's now sending a frigate. The French will probably get involved on a much broader scale. But I think some messages are going to have to be sent to Iran. You have to understand, they also had a command and control ship down there, right? The Saviz uh, and the Ben Shad. They're two vessels that they were parking right off of Yemen to do intelligence collection, to help the Houthis target merchant vessels. That ship has now moved out of the area. Uh, but, you know, that ship is seen as a threat to Israel more than to the United States. As these merchant ships try to come from Iran, transship weapons, I think a demonstration will eventually have to be made. And usually that will, you know, normally we take those weapons and uh, we distribute them, you know, ship them to Ukraine, which would be great for us. But some would, we're going to be bringing ballistic missiles and things like that. We're going to have to, you know, likely board, seize and destroy. Well, it seems we still have at least a couple of months ahead of us before uh, and the Gaza Strip has been freed of Hamas. Hopefully that will be end of this and there won't be an escalation with more fighting in uh, northern Israel or rather southern Lebanon. Um, but uh, I think we'll have to return to the topic and see how things develop and come back to it. Thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure.